Buongiorno, ladies and gentlemen, Wikimedians and Wikimaniacs. My name is Brian. Uh, if you have seen me pop up on your watch list somewhere, it would be as BD2412. And I am here today to answer the question, can Wikimedia go to the movies? Now, what do I mean by go to the movies? When I say can Wikimedia go to the movies, I'm talking about producing feature length, quality documentary content. Documentaries of the kind that you would see on the History Channel or the Discovery Channel, but under the Wikimedia name. So the first question that we want to ask is, why should Wikimedia provide audiovisual documentary content? Now, I, I really enjoyed the last two speakers, and I, I love the direction that they're going in terms of graphics we have uh, and incorporating different kinds of interactive or better graphics into articles. I'm talking about dispensing with the article altogether and just having a documentary that is purely audiovisual content. And why would we do that? In 2014, I went to Wikimania in London, and I talked to many great people who had brilliant ideas about different ways that we could expand the Wikimedia footprint, reach more people, provide more information in ways that was digestible to everyone who's looking at it. Ideas like having a physical brick and mortar Wikimedia location in every major city, uh, like having QR codes uh, on the front of monuments that a visitor could just scan with their phone and be taken directly to the Wikipedia article on that topic. Having 3D printer codes that are stored in commons so someone with the capability could download that and actually print an object that someone has uploaded to commons, like a, a spoon, you know, if they want to see what one looks like. Um, having live stream camera footage showing famous uh, thoroughfares or the tiger exhibit at the Smithsonian Zoo. But of all the ideas that I heard, uh, the one that struck me as the one capable of reaching and providing information to the most people is providing documentary content. I mean, think about this. How many of you enjoy watching documentaries? It's everybody. We all do. It's a, it's a universal thing. And why is that? Well, let's talk about that. Here's the uh, current text of the Wikipedia article on the Komodo dragon. Now, Wikimedia is great with textual materials, even incorporating photographs and illustrations, but not everybody can read. We have people who have, uh, the, are unable to read and people who have lower uh, reading abilities, and we want to reach them. We want to be able to provide information that they may be looking for. And even among people who can read, not everybody can read the language that content is best presented in. Can anyone out there identify what language that is? That is, uh, it's, is Thai and Malayalam the same thing? I think it's Malayalam, but um, that may be the language they speak in Thailand. But yeah, I mean, I, I picked this because it's unintelligible to me as a reader, but it may be a really great article. And to people who don't speak English, which is the uh, most robust language for the presentation of information, on uh, Wikipedia, you know, our content, English language content, may be as unintelligible, even though we could explain things through audiovisual means. Technology, and I think this was brought up by the previous speaker, is also uh, heading towards more convenient audiovisual platforms. How many people in this room have a device on which you can watch video? Right, we all do now, it's our phone. Uh, it's, it's a universal thing that people carry a phone and the same device we use to communicate with the world, we can watch audiovisual content on. And the device that is suited to fit in your pocket, which is you know, what we aim for phones, is not necessarily the best platform to read text. You know, it's difficult. You either have to scroll across the screen or it's really tiny. But if you're watching a video, you know, it's easy to listen to, it's perhaps easier to see the imagery. Now that's one end of things. Having audiovisual content, having documentaries uh, on a website under the Wikipedia banner, or Wikimedia banner, would allow us to reach a lot of people who don't necessarily have the ability, 
either because of the device they have or because of their level of education or where they're educated to read the articles we have. Um, and also, not everybody learns best by reading. There are basically three kinds of learners. There are those who learn by reading, uh, who see the words and develop the imagery in their mind as they read and can internalize things that way. There are, um, there are kinesthetic learners, those who learn by like physically touching things, they take things apart and put them together, and having that experience of doing things with their hands allows them to learn. And there are audio-visual learners who learn best by hearing things and seeing things. The second reason, though, is that we will attract new participants and new contributors. Because let's face it, making movies is sexy. If we're talking about making audiovisual content, we're going to draw in a whole new world of contributors. We have millions of people who contribute to Wikimedia products, projects, but they are primarily contributing to a text platform. So perhaps they're drawn here because they're more interested in contributing to a text platform. We know that there are at least hundreds of thousands of people out there in the world who are interested in creating the elements of a documentary and in creating footage of interesting things that are going on in the world, things in nature. And we know this because they're doing it now and they're, they're making videos and they're uploading them to places like YouTube. Uh, and they're not putting them in any Wikimedia controlled or Wikimedia governed uh, platform because we don't have the platform for it. It's, it's not really convenient to make lengthy video subjects and put them in commons even. So by making a platform available for people to begin creating documentaries through Wikimedia, we'll draw in hundreds of thousands of people who say, you know what, I would love to work on a documentary. And if I can do that collaboratively and I can make a piece of it and know somebody else is gonna make a piece of it and it's all gonna come together into something really interesting and exciting and accessible, then I'm down for that. I'm going to get into it. And making movies is becoming easier for all of us. How many people in this room have a device on which you can record video? It's the same device. We all have that now. We're all cameramen carrying cameras around with us. I went to a, a workshop yesterday about how to make uh, a mini documentary and techniques for you know, how to hold your phone and uh, what kind of editing software you can get that's free on the web. And it was, it was very elucidating and heartening uh, to know that you know, we have this ability. Because any one of us can happen to be in a place where something remarkable happens and capture that on video. And if it's uh, something historic, then we can capture that and put it right in the Wikipedia article that talks about it. And if we have documentary capability, we can put it right in the documentary that talks about it. So we all have this now. And I know a lot of people will think that, well, Yes, but it's not really high quality that you get from phones. Um, there's a company called Light right now that is working on a phone that has 16 apertures of different focal lengths, and it fires off 10 of them at a time and creates a composite image from those that is movie film quality uh, in terms of your ability to zoom in and out of the picture and, and, and capture uh, subtle things in the image. So we're moving in that direction, and right now that costs, or is projected to cost, I think, $1,800. But as the technology progresses, it's going to become less and less expensive. So we will all, within the next few generations of cell phones, have in our pocket a device that can capture really high quality footage. And on top of that, of those people who I talked about before, the hundreds of thousands who are making YouTube videos and putting those up because you know, they're interested in some kind of animal or interested in some historic landmark. A lot of them have really high quality camera equipment. Some of us may have really high quality camera equipment that we could right away start capturing things that would be useful to put into a documentary. So that leads me to the next question. How does Wikimedia go to the movies? How do we provide documentary audiovisual content? What we need is a platform. And we have a platform for text. We have a very good, productive, obviously tens of millions of articles have been created by people collaboratively using this platform. 
Uh, and when you talk about the platform for text, underneath all that is just ones and zeros. We have ones and zeros that represent a letter or a number. Audiovisual content in the digital world is the same. It's just ones and zeros. There are a lot more of them because they represent every pixel on the screen, perhaps. Um, but if we can create a platform where we can collaboratively edit text, then we can create a platform where we can collaboratively edit video. Uh, in fact, there is... Um, Mozilla has been working on a collaborative video editing platform, an online collaborative platform where people can put different pieces of video together, select cuts and lengths of video, and just edit them together collaboratively, uh, just like we do with our articles, called Popcorn Maker. Now, I, I understand that the production of that is stalled for some reason, but you know we don't need to wait. We can move forward with creating our own collaborative editing platform. And that's all we need. Uh, in terms of in terms of the coding, you know, in terms of the actual content, there are all kinds of things that are available to us. Just as an example, I made this brief documentary on the Komodo dragon. And it uses its forked tongue to taste and smell the air. It's sensitive enough to detect prey over five miles away. Now here's the. Same thing in Chinese. And this just illustrates the, the point that if we can create a, an imagery and then we can put a track behind it that is the audio, we can do 50 tracks behind it that are the audio for 50 different languages for the same set of images. Uh, now, I cheated a little bit because I don't think anybody would actually consider that to be a documentary on the Komodo dragon. But in fairness, I don't think anyone would consider this to be a complete encyclopedia article on the Komodo dragon. This is the very first version of the Komodo dragon encyclopedia article as it appeared on Wikipedia. And it was a seed that was planted. When you have the capability for collaborative editing, then it takes one person to plant a seed and other people to build on it until ultimately you come together to the, the first slide that I showed, the, the Komodo Dragon article, um, which is full and rich and thorough. And if we have the capacity to put together documentaries collaboratively, then on the subjects that are of broad interest, we will very shortly have world-class documentaries where lots of people have put in some audiovisual information, some background um, audio track. Uh, now, in addition to what the Komodo dragon footage represents, you know, this, is, this is raw footage that a Wikimedian filmed and put on commons. Everything here is on commons. Um, and then most of it is the stuff that is in slides is found stuff that I went and looked for and somebody else had already previously uploaded. So there, there's a lot of resource that's there already. Um, but you know, we, we can create this raw footage. Here's a a traditional Brazilian dance. You know, we can capture human activity, and there is supposed to be sound behind this, but there isn't for some reason. That's all right. And here's another one that I included. Uh... Okay, the sound was delayed. And I should probably wait until it ends. I included this. This is also an image already in Commons, or actually a video already in Commons, because it's an illustration of uh, some higher quality video that we already have here. Um, well, that's one reason. The other reason is because this waterfall also happens to be in northern Italy. So if anyone is interested in visiting there, it's about a four hour drive to the west. And it's a, it's a location that you can go see right now. Now, in addition to, and these are, these are things that were filmed by Wikimedians and put on comments, there are also uh, a wide range of public domain, of examples of public domain footage that are in existence. This is an 1899 picture of a cruiser, or sorry, a video of a cruiser. You know, it's, it's obviously in the public domain by age. There are, um, there are video shots or video clips that are in the public domain, uh, either by age or because they were produced by governments who released their work into the public domain, or because they were in the past produced by 
individuals who released their work in the public domain. This one I find very interesting. This is in 1905, or sorry, in 1894, um, released in 1895, uh, video footage of a naval battle in the Sino-Japanese War. And it's one of the oldest existing pieces of um, war footage. And it's, you know, the kind of thing that we, if we have a documentary on that war, that would be included. We also have, as has been discussed in the last couple of presentations, um, graphics that people create. You know? So they're not filmed. Um, they're just something that someone who has the capacity uh, has put together. This, for example, is a map of uh, carbon levels around the world uh, over a certain period. It's a, kind of an interesting way to illustrate it. You know, here we have a diagram of the human body and how uh, a portion of it looks with certain layers being removed, something that you would obviously have in a documentary on uh, a particular organ or a particular bodily system. This is the only GIF file. Everything else that's moving on my uh, presentation is an OG file. This is the only GIF file, but of course, anything that you can present in uh, an OG file format, you know, you can put it in a GIF file format also. There are different ways to do the animation. And anything that exists in this format, you can work into a documentary. And of course, there are far more complicated things that can be illustrated. Another area that we can cover in documentaries, something that uh, Wikipedia and Wikimedia doesn't do very much of now, is interviews with subject matter experts. Now, when you go through an article, um, the ideal article has lots of citations, footnotes to citations to a source. The source is something written by an expert. Uh, we know that it is because either it's peer-reviewed uh, or it's published reputably. But you know, those, those writers, the people who write those, they're people. Uh, they're out there. They exist. Uh, every subject that is out there has experts in the subject matter. Uh, a lot of them are, will be affiliated with a university or an institution of some kind. Now, this is just a, an interview that someone conducted um, actually at Wikimedia. And I'm afraid the sound is not going to play for this either. So that's enough, but as you can see, you know, we have one Wikimedian interviewing another. Wherever subject matter experts live in the world, Wikimedians live because we're everywhere. We're all over the world. There is somebody who is the person who lives closest to this professor of biology or professor of history or professor of architecture who is the expert on a particular thing that we might want to cover. And we can train our people to go in, know how to ask the right questions, know how to position the camera to capture the interview, record this footage. Think of documentaries that you've seen where they cut away to the person uh, sitting in the leather chair, talking about the subject with a little banner with the person's name under that. We can do that. We can take the audio of that person talking and use it as a track under some video of what they're talking about. Uh, we also have the possibility of doing dramatic reenactments. Now, this is just some uh, lovely German ladies showing how butter used to be churned uh, back before we used modern technological methods. But, you know, there are reenactors in a lot of different fields, people who go and wear the costume and act out the things that people did in the past. When you have documentaries about historical figures, if you were to do a documentary on Napoleon, you would find someone who looks the part, dress them as Napoleon, have them act out some things that Napoleon did, and include that in your documentary. And that's uh, something that you see on the History Channel and other places that produce documentaries. That's something we're capable of doing. You know, it's a little more involved and complex than editing the text, but we have a community of people that does get together and do remarkable things. So that is certainly within our ability. And then lastly, there are some other elements to documentaries that might not leap to mind immediately, but uh, most good documentaries have music in the background. There's a tremendous wealth of public domain music, classical or otherwise, that can fit into the background of a documentary that we were to put together. Um, there's bumper music. Wikimedia doesn't have uh, 
what I would call bumper music, which is a, a theme sound. Like uh, whenever you see the beginning of a National Geographic show, they play their, their trumpet theme. Um, I made a little bumper music for my presentation, which was at the very beginning. And I think Wikimedia should have that you know, either way, but if we're going to get into documentaries, which uh, we can and should, then we'll definitely need that. And uh, also you need things like fades and transitions, you know, to know just how to go from one shot to another. There are interesting ways to do that. It's something to keep in the back of your mind, but that's the last basically element of a documentary that you need. So we can capture raw footage of the things we need to capture. We can interview experts. We can find reenactors or be reenactors. We can create, as we've seen in the past couple presentations, um, very intricate animations and graphics. And we can tie all those together with narrations in multiple languages to create something where you go to a channel, uh, or you go to a Wikipedia article and it has a link to the documentary on that subject, and you can see a maybe a 45-minute documentary, maybe a 90-minute, maybe a five-minute documentary on some subject that is, uh, there's not much to say about it. It's you know, small or obscure, but it's interesting enough that you can say a little bit about it, and that's enough for people to watch and get what they want. Uh, when I bring this up, the question I'm often asked is, how do we select topics? How do we decide what to make a documentary on? And I say we don't. We don't do that for articles. We're talking about the same kind of platform. We're talking about somebody who's interested in something existing as a documentary, planting a seed, doing the work, the labor of love that uh, we all often do when we start a new article, and then other people who share that interest jumping in. And as with uh, Wikipedia and other Wikimedia projects, you know, some things will languish, some things will draw a lot of attention and become really great. Uh, one of the things I've always found interesting is when you look at the list of featured articles, there are a lot of things that you expect to be there. There's a featured article on George Washington or Paris or something like that. And there are a lot of little subjects that are really obscure, but enough people cared about it, they all got together and they made something remarkable. And I believe that that is exactly what would happen if we open up an opportunity for people to make documentaries on a Wikimedia platform. So in conclusion, I would like to see us win the Academy Award for Best Documentary Feature. Uh, I think collaboratively with all the skills and knowledge of all the people who collectively work on Wikimedia or would work on Wikimedia if they had the ability to do this, uh, we're right in the zone for doing that. Uh, my last comment is I had originally proposed to do uh, two, two talks, and one of them was going to be about the place of humor in Wikipedia. Uh, so how many Wikipedians does it take to change a light bulb? And the answer is 3,072. But that is, that is it for my, uh, my presentation, and I hope that people are in agreement with me that we should have a platform and means to create documentaries, and we should get to work on them. I uh, thank you for this. I've been sort of an advocate of this idea of using of, of, a, of producing, so to speak, branded videos for a long time. However, I wouldn't quite go as far as calling them documentaries, more like video versions of the content we already have, because when you call something a documentary, you start getting into questions of original research, and I'm not sure you know, what the community would think about that, but if we produce documentaries that are, you know, that only have the uh, facts that we've already put in an encyclopedia article about something, so I think we're on good grounds with that, but there's, there's still a lot of issues with our other policies, and you know, I still haven't seen people thinking much about that. You talk about the bumper music, and that's great, but then sometimes, you, you know, I've seen videos that people have uploaded already where they put music into it, and I find myself screaming, what's the copyright status of the music? Did you bother to check on whether it was freely licensed? or in the public domain before you put that in, because then if you didn't, then the whole, then the whole video is, is, is unfree. 
So those are, those are two very good points. Uh, first of all, documentary is kind of a loaded word. You see a lot of documentarians um, who have a point of view that they want to press, and they use the format to put out what is, in their view, evidence in support of that. Um, however, I think you would still call something, if you took an encyclopedia article, if you took our encyclopedia article and you fully kind of illustrated it with video uh, and perhaps interviews with experts and things of that sort, uh, I don't know what you would really call it other than a documentary. I mean, you could just say it's an audiovisual presentation. Call it a video article. Yeah, you, you could call it that. Um, I like documentary. Uh, you, you have to call it a documentary to win the Academy Award, I think. Um, and, you know, it, it does convey the sense that, uh, you know, we have, we have some projects like, like Wikiversity and Wikibooks where we go a little bit off of saying, okay, we're going to be um, necessarily completely neutral, but, you know, you always make choices in writing an article in terms of what is important to present and they're, they're editorial choices, but you know, I, I, I don't, I'm not of the subscription to the belief that you ever really get 100% away from the viewpoints of people who are working on the project. So I'm not uncomfortable calling things documentaries if they have all those elements. Uh, as for the, the copyright in like the background music, um, yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, everything that I, I put into this is on commons. The bumper music I made with my little guitar at home. Um, and, you know, as, as I said, there are a tremendous amount, there is a tremendous amount of music, especially classical music, where there are versions, at least, in the public domain. And we there are also websites where people put up their own music and licensed mm -hmm. it under the appropriate Creative Commons. You know, you, exactly. I've learned that you can't use Creative, you know, the, you cannot use the Creative Commons no derivatives, you know, flavor because video makes it a derivative, putting it to a soundtrack automatically makes it a derivative yes. work. Yeah, I, and we, um, I don't think we'd do anything particularly differently than we already do with articles in terms of if you want to add an image to an article, you better be sure it's an image that's in the public domain or that you have uh, some ability to use under the appropriate copyright regime or intellectual property regime. And, you know, because uh, what we're talking about is collaboratively edited content, these documentaries would remain open for editing forever. So at some point, someone could add something, and someone else could come along and say, uh, that's covered by copyright. You can't have it. Take it out. Back in 2013, there was a similar presentation at Wikimania Hong Kong where people discussed the possibility, perhaps, of at some point developing a way to edit the video online as opposed to having to download pieces of other people's videos and... Uh, edit them together on your own software and then re-upload the result. It's, you know, someone said it's one of the presenters at that, Manuel Schneider, who I think is here, but is involved with running the event because it's, he's with, big with Wikimedia Switzerland. Um, but he pointed out that, you know, if, uh, you know, editing a video is not like editing an article. You know, we can do a lot, it's a lot easier to collaboratively edit a piece of text than it is a, yes. uh, a it's video. It's easier, um, but it's still possible to go either way. So, the other, uh, yes. Um, I think uh, there is a fundamental uh, issue to compare uh, text and video because uh, they don't provide the same uh, information and they don't uh, have the same purpose. That is true. And a video uh, is difficult to uh, create, to uh, update, to uh, edit, to uh, seed, because it's a, a very uh, heavy format, difficult to uh, upload when we have a, a low internet connection. Uh, when we don't have a, a smartphone. So uh, it's uh, absolutely inaccessible to a lot of people. You can uh, uh, use uh, an accessibility tool to uh, read a video, but you have accessibility tools to uh, read a text. Um, video are not interactive. You can click on a link uh, to uh, access to a, a source or something. And you can, um, you can do without a large textual explanation with a video. Because um, 
encyclopedism is not just uh, creating videos. It's not enough to uh, explain uh, difficult concepts, uh, um, subtle um, uh, situations, uh, conflictual knowledge. Uh, so I think it's um, a dangerous way to uh, uh, want to transform the knowledge only in video because the language is uh, the best way to um, uh, share uh, subtleties of uh, the knowledge. It's why, why we, have, uh, why we are, uh, create the language. Well, absolutely. Um, there are certainly challenges unique to having a video presentation uh, in terms of you know, there are accessibility challenges that might apply to video that don't apply to text. Um, there are higher barriers to being able to edit it. So, you know, that does make it uh, seem more exclusive. Um, but, you know, I think uh, the dangers inherent in it are um, outweighed by the benefits, by the possibility of reaching a lot of people who just, who aren't reached by text at all or aren't best reached by text. Uh, and you know, we've had an, an incredible experience in Wikimedia of coming across challenges like those uh, in all different areas and as a community finding the solutions and implementing the solutions. And you know, nothing is perfect along those lines, but we're better for having done it. And I think that if we have documentary footage uh, there are, you know, one of the things that you mentioned was that in the article you can show the sources. Um, often on a YouTube video now, you know, there's a point in the video where when they're saying a certain thing, a little box will appear on the screen, someone can put there, that you can actually click on, it will take you to a link. Yes, and it, it interrupts the process, and it is text, and it's necessary for it to be text. Um, but if we're interested in, uh, which I think we are, in showing our sources, then, you know, first of all, there would be some text accompanying the video that would say, here are where the, the sources are from which we get our information for each piece of information. Uh, possibly something incorporated into the video that you can click to take you to the text. Always some kind of linkage or interface between the video and the article, which has sources and uh, predominantly will likely be the sources that we're going to rely on because our videos, if we make documentaries, we want the information to be the same. We don't want contradictory information. Um, you know, we want it to be reflective of, this is sort of the audio-visual experience uh, of the article, if it's, if it's possible to do that. So, yes, to the greatest extent possible, you know, I believe in cross-linking the projects that we have, um, and whatever ways that there are to do this with audio-visual, uh, whether it's something in the platform where uh, you can actually click as you go or something um, that reminds you as you go, hey, all the sources for this are in the article, uh, or some text on the page where the video is presented, you know, like they have on a YouTube channel, they have a little place for sources. There's usually not much of use there, but uh, there's uh, certainly would be a place for that in a project that we did. Uh, hello. Zova. Oh, sorry? Um, well, I think a documentary prevent, presents things in kind of with a different flavor. Uh, I would hope, obviously, that, the in, that there, we wouldn't have conflicts of information. This is the primary thing. Uh, documentaries, because they're narrated and not necessarily... Um, you know, they're, they're not going to be able to present the same volume of information across the same space necessarily. But, you know, that's a question of selecting what information we present, not of having a different set of information in a documentary. I think ideally the documentary uh, of any subject is a, an audiovisual equivalent of our article on the subject. You know, the documentary narrative, at least, is text. And text is... Um, edited in the same way. Um, collaboratively, people write what the words are going to be, and you know, someone reads them and puts them in that way. Um, 
And I don't think that process, the process of, of writing the textual component would be any different than writing a Wikipedia article, uh, except that we are looking primarily as to how things sound when they're said more than how they read when they're read. Sorry. Oh yes, and well, what, we do, what we do with articles is we collaborate and we uh, come to agreements. You know, we have discussions and develop consensus. Um, and it may be that with audiovisual material, we would need to lean a bit more on let's develop a consensus before we make the change and be a little bit less bold about making changes. But you know, ultimately, that would be the process of, of people who are working on a particular item, a particular documentary is you know, the word that I'm using for them, um, agreeing that, OK, we should end this clip at this point, and we should say this underneath it. Hi, Brian. Um, I have a question for you. It's here. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I enjoyed your, your presentation because uh, I'm from, from Amical, from the Catalan Wikipedia, and we have been many things that you have spoken in this speech. We, we have been leaching you know, content from local TVs, and we have also a project with local radio stations. I actually ran an a interview show, and we interview people. So we are getting yes. projects very similar to what you propose. Mm -hmm. But the thing that shocked me is the, the fact that in two different times you have, uh, you have said that we don't have a, a a good platform to, to make these kind of things. And well, in Catalan Wikimedia, with videos and with audios, we have been working with Commons uh, perfectly. I don't see the problem. A, a platform for, you mean the, the editing platform? You have to say something like, uh, we don't have the, the appropriate platform maybe to make documentaries or making videos, you know, as, as, as in a good way as we make uh, text. Uh, if there is one, I haven't seen it. Uh, but I mean, if there's if there's a uh, if there's a platform that is being used now, I'd, I'd love to see that and work with it. Um, I don't know that we have something where people can collaboratively like take different pieces of video and audio and work them together into a, a lengthy um, kind of feature. Uh, it's a what? Oh, just, uh, I understand that, and you know, nothing worth doing is easy. I think actually, what we would need to do is find easier ways to transform other uh, in third-party providers transform other formats into uh, OG files and then not worry about ourselves handling the licensing. But I think I'm out of time. Yeah, so they have, to, they have to close the auditorium so they're turning the lights off and kicking me out. But thank you very much. Thank you.